first Wednesday community lunch here at the Divinity School. I'm Karen Wine, the director of communications here. Um, I see a lot of new student faces, I think. Otherwise, I'd be so recognized. <laughs> but thank you for coming today to our lunch. Um, if you haven't been here today, we'll introduce our format. We do a little bit of housekeeping. We do some announcements. We have a speaker, and then we have some Q&A. So let me start with some announcements. First of all, as you can see, your meal was cooked here from scratch today by our student crew who are in the back still serving. And our
grad of our program, but she did a PhD in religion and literature at Duke, so she can, she's our okay. <laughs> <laughs> So Taryn asked me for a title, and I didn't give her one. But I have one, and it's called Walls of Separation 5.0. Um, so I'm not really sure what this is. Um, it's a combination, I know it's a combination of two things, and I know where it came from, so that'll have to do. I want to talk about secularism, and I want to talk about a recent debate about secularism uh, between Charles Taylor and Akhil Bilgrami. I also want to talk a little bit about what I think the implications are for that, about public conversation about religion. Um, I want to say at the outset that there's a much longer keynote that this is based on, and one of the things I have the deepest misgivings about and what I'm going to say to you is it is very theoretical in certain ways. And in the longer version, I talk at length about all this in relation to Flannery O'Connor. And I can say something about that if you want to hear about that, but I couldn't wedge that in here without doing some of the other things I wanted to do. So, um, uh, you know, that by way of introduction. The other thing I'll tell you is it's a wonderful story. Some of you won't remember because you're much younger than me. But there was a great New Testament scholar named Garrett Tyson, and I once heard him give the Zenos lectures at McCormick Seminary, and he received an incredible introduction to a first lecture, and he got up, and Tyson's about this tall. So he like, they had to adjust everything, and he stood on books. And he said, well, that was a very nice introduction. And he said, I think the only way I can respond is to tell you my strategy when I speak in public. He said, I know I'm boring, so I always plant a mistake somewhere in the middle. And I say to the audience, your job is to find a mistake, because then I'll keep them awake. <laughs> and he said, the only thing is they always find more than one. <laughs> so I think you all should apply that mentality to what follows. OK. Um, I'd like to focus today really on Charles Taylor's A Secular Age and a very interesting critique of it, which just came out last year from Akhil Dobrani, a philosopher at Columbia University. Um, I want to lay out what I take to be the terms of the debate between the two of them and then talk about what it means for institutions that aspire to think about religion. Um, so I'm going to start with Charles Taylor's A Secular Age, which is a book that was published in 2007. It was based on Gifford lectures he, he gave. And the secular age, a secular age, posits the idea that there are three notions of secularity that are at play in our thinking about modernity. One is the idea that secularity is the expulsion of religion from sphere after sphere of public life. So what we see in modernity is the way religion is continu continually removed from realms of public discourse. There's a kind of a sort of progressive towards zero-sum game going on. That's one definition of secularism. The second definition is just the decline of religious belief and practice. Um, the idea that fewer people are voluntarily being involved in religion, that fewer institutions are maintaining a robust profile, that there's just a kind of disaffection going on here. And the third definition, and the one that Taylor's book argues for and focuses on, is the idea, and I'm going to quote here, that the conditions of experience of and search for the spiritual are such that they make it possible to speak of ours as a secular age. That's to say that what describes secularism is the idea that we are constantly trying to find something that we do not have. And that that's really what secularism is. And the book proceeds to pursue that idea. Now, it's worth saying that there are versions of Secularism 3 that are fittingly at best acknowledged by Taylor in his book. Um, if you're familiar with Peter Berger's work in the Sacred Canopy, Jose Casanova and Public Religions in the Modern World, David Martin's various books, in various ways they focus on certainly one and two and verge on three. But people who have advocated Taylor's book and Taylor himself want to suggest that the focus he puts on the third definition of this search for something has two huge advantages over all the predecessors. Um, the first is that by focusing on this, um, what we do is we get away from the notion that this is a conceptual problem. But it's actually not that. Uh, we intellectualize it in some way as a debate. 
And then secondly, and this is concomitant with the first point, the result of that is that we transform the debate from a conceptual or an analytical to a historiographic or narrative one. So that when we talk about secularism, we shouldn't be talking about categories of knowledge and analysis, but a kind of story of modernity, in effect. And the result of this, and, and um, it's fascinating to go read the reviews of Taylor. If, if one of the virtues, you know, Taylor's book is 800 pages long. It's much too long. Everyone would agree about that. And he's a very smart guy, so it's worth reading. But it's also worth reading to then go and read all the people who comment on it, because you learn a tremendous amount about the terrain. And it's fascinating to me, for instance, that someone like Robert Bella thought that this book was absolutely the pinnacle of thinking about religion. And that someone like Charles Larmore thought it was absolutely a debit to that. Really interesting. And you read their reviews, and you learn a lot about what demarcates discussion on this. But the argument for Taylor goes as follows, that this rendering of our history in the past in narrative form is such that it's not science or Darwinism or something like that that accounts for the displacement of religious authority. It's really the development of this long moral narrative which Christianity itself participates in. And it's a narrative, and I really do think that this is what Taylor says, in which, and this is the way I would put it, and there's some reasons I put it this way that I'll get to in a second, in which it's Semper Ray from Manda Gone Wild, that Christianity has at its base um, this idea that in place of a world in which one can't believe in God or wouldn't believe in God, and in ritual, in which ritual and its attendant resonances effectively created a world that was enchanted. That's part of Taylor's argument. But before 1500, the world was enchanted in some way. We were reflexively believers. What we really have is the development of what was there from the start, which is a kind of contrapuntal emphasis in Christianity on society. And that that gathers steam over time. And so what happens is that when Luther nails his theses into that church door at Wittenberg, um, that's a deeply Christian act, but it's a move against enchantment. It's a move away from a default setting. And the effect of this for Taylor can be captured, and he talks about this in the book, in a discussion about Nietzsche. So whereas the conceptual analytic discussion of secularism will index Nietzsche's comment, God is dead. What Taylor is much more interested in is the place in Thus Spoke Zarathustra where Nietzsche says all the problems of modernity were born in Luther's parsonage. This idea that somehow rather than there being this sort of you know, death of God that emerges through this analytic debate, there's actually this kind of transformation of, of an emphasis that's always been there in the Christian tradition, but it evolves and develops and, and and becomes more powerful, it overwhelms the other thing. <clears throat> and as a consequence, secularism only makes sense for Taylor as an outgrowth of a kind of social improvement or ameliorism that is not non-Christian at all. It's partly Christian. And so when we talk about secularity, we have to talk about Christianity as a practice on its own terms, as participating in this. Um, I mentioned earlier that I, I, I really recommend Charles Larmore uh, for a critique of this book. Um, and, and, you know, part of what Larmore says, which I really think is, is right, whatever one thinks about the general move Taylor is going to make, is he says, this is a really Catholic version of the story. Um, it's amazing that a book about modernity and religion and Christianity never mentions Friedrich Schleiermacher or Rudolf Bultmann. It's incredible, in fact. So that you have, you know, an you have an argument that simply isn't present, that is central to the culture at this time, in what we now think of as emergent liberal Protestantism, which is trying to deal with precisely these questions of the relationship between the social life of Christianity and its belief systems and things like that. Taylor pays no attention to that at all. And there's also a wonderful set of short responses to the book in our Journal of Religion by faculty here. We had Taylor here at the time the book came out. And among others, I would really highlight Willie Minot's critique of his claim for enchantment pre-1500. Um, she argues in her response, I think quite effectively, that what Taylor does is he construes 
the patristic and medieval periods as being non-reflective in a way that is, you know, almost laughable, actually, to the historian. It is laughable to the historian. She was laughing as she wrote it. <laughs> but um, but it's, it's, it's just interesting to see how that plays out and how necessary it is to tailor that 1500 is this fulcrum, right? And, and, and worrisome. At the same time, you know, I, when I gave this paper at the conference, someone said to me, well, why do people care about Taylor at all? Which is a fair question. And the thing I think you have to say is he gives you a grand narrative. And we don't have enough of those, frankly. We should have more, hint, hint to all of you. Um, not your dissertation, but at some point. And, and uh, not just your dissertation project, but at some point. But you should be thinking about that, right? That we, we don't have enough books that do this kind of work, in effect. And, and I'm not interested in trashing Taylor. If you haven't read him, you really should. But I do think there are real questions here that, that need to be asked, and that are good questions, and are part of the risk of doing this kind of work. That said, the most sympathetic and also the most searching critique of Taylor that I've seen just appeared last year in this book written by Akhil Bilbrami, who's a philosopher who works both on the one hand in analytic traditions, but also with non-Western materials. Um, two cardinal reference points throughout the book are the novels of Salman Rushdie and the political philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi. So right away you have someone whose frame of reference is extremely different from Taylor in relation to all this. Now there are two aspects of this long essay of Bill Brahmi's um, that, that are really striking to me. Um, and at the same time, I can't easily reconcile them. On the one hand, Bill Brahmi goes on at some length, and I think sincerely, by the way, I don't need to impugn that, about his appreciation for a shared political sensibility that he has with Taylor. Um, he's really pleased that Taylor recognizes that um, there ought to be a sense of real distress among people who are thinking about religion and modernity over the, at best, slack and often hostile incorporation of underrepresented and so-called minority religious traditions in this conversation, um, especially Islam, but uh, notably in India, Hindu as well, and Buddhist voices that participate vigorously in debates of, in civil discourse and its delineations of religion. There's none of that in Taylor's book. But Taylor is very keen about the problem, in effect. And so Bill Brahmi agrees with him. And Taylor's argument is largely based on the category of religion being recuperated in a way that would bring other traditions into that discourse. So even though he doesn't talk about them, he, he in principle, wants that to happen. And he's extremely worried, for instance, about the capacity of our discourse right now to talk about a Muslim terrorist in a way that makes Muslim terrorists equal Islam. He's very good, Taylor's very good on that, and Bill Brahmi is resonating about that. Now, having gone on at some pretty significant lengths to assert his appreciation for Taylor and his sense of urgency regarding a, the fullest recognition of what religion is, um, he nonetheless makes it very clear that he demurs from Taylor's favorable invocation of the classic principle of a wall between church and state, and that he wishes to play, replace the notion of state neutrality regarding religion with what he calls a principle, this is Bill Brahmi now, of equidistance. Bill Brahmi's argument for equidistance pivots on his development of the idea of secularism itself is a philosophy of life and that it can and properly should be at the center of the state in fostering civil discourse. And he says that secularism so understood can practice a kind of lexical ordering, which is a revisionist appropriation of John Rawls' usage of the term in the theory of justice. Now, pause. I, at least, I doubt all of you, but I needed a primer on Rawls' principle um, I haven't read a theory of justice, but it's been a while. And it turns out that lexicographical ordering is the principle that one must completely satisfy a first principle before beginning to apply a second. Okay, so just as one has to, it, 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 it indexes alphabetizing dictionaries and things like that, but it's been appropriated in philosophy to sort out the, rel the relevance of particular principles for reasoning in public discourse. So you can't go to particular applications of, of, of uh, notions of religious 
equality until you establish what a religion is and what equality is and what is the relation to that kind of thing. So this lexicographical ordering principle is very important. Now, the way Bill Gromme uses it here is to argue for a secularism whose chief responsibility is to ensure that certain political goods for all rightly trump, and I don't mean that as a pun. When I read this, I didn't think of that. People just started laughing immediately. That they rightly trump, in both recognition and realization, certain goods of religious peoples or communities when the goods of the state conflict with the goods of the religion. Now, behind this is another philosophical idea. That's Bernard Williams' idea that all religions proceed on the basis of internal reason. And so, therefore, they are axiomatically self-regarding and local in their rationality. So that the state's job is to provide a kind of general rationality in effect. Now, the consequence of this, for why Bill Gromme wants to eliminate the wall of separation are as follows. Because, in his view, secularism has legitimate interests that, lexically ordered, must themselves be satisfied before any religious interests are satisfied, it's the case that secularism may, and indeed at times should, have the capacity to offer specific religious communities internal reasons to comply with the state. Okay, I'm going to read that again. Lexically ordered, secularism has legitimate interests that must themselves be satisfied before the satisfaction of religious interests. Which means that secularism may and should have the capacity to offer specific religious communities internal reasons to comply with the state. This gave me pause, but we'll get to that. While this is very far, to be clear on my reading, from some sort of, you know, I have to draw on the tradition I know best, late Augustine-like statement of compelling people to enter the church. I don't think that's at all what Bill Gromme means. It may be akin, from a different perspective, to something like Martin Luther's confident assertion in the table talk that the faithful Christian can serve without compunction as the hangman for a tenant. In the service of underscoring what I take to be a particular respect in which Taylor would strongly demur from Bill Gromme, I may slightly overstate this point, but I don't think by much, and I was with Bill Gromme-ites who didn't think I got this wrong, for what it's worth. Bill Gromme's, but there's absolutely no question, whatever the extent of it is, that properly understood secularism has such a role vis-a-vis religion in the community. The illustration of this in the essay, it's a very interesting one, and I would love to learn more about it over time, is the attitude adopted by the founding Indian parliamentarians in 1948 toward minority Muslim communities that had remained in the nation in the aftermath of the Civil War. The theorists of the Indian state recognized that if they were to banish these communities, they would effectively eliminate their languages and their cultures, and for that reason they decided not to pursue such a course of action. But the argument as presented for not pursuing it won the day because it was also noted that it would not only be quite likely, but in the end quite necessary for those Muslim communities to conform to the state. So you can see how this plays out in a nuanced way. There's a sense in which what Bill Gromme is arguing for is this idea that over time, religions will morph and adapt to the secularist model. They'll accommodate themselves to it, and you can begin to see why someone like Taylor might be wrestling with that, given the worry about the associations that go on normally with religion and particular acts. Behind this is this notion that what ought to be the case is that secularism is in an equidistant relation to religious traditions, and here Bill Gromme invokes the idea of a circle, so that secularism and the state are at the core of society, and the religions create a kind of penumbra about it, and it's extremely important for the state to maintain the same attitude towards all religions, hence the word equidistant. And I want to come back to this idea of a circle at the end of the talk. Now, as I said earlier, the puzzle for me with Bill Gromme's essay is I can't quite 
reconcile, and I don't mean by that to say he's inconsistent, I just can't quite get my head around the statement he makes that while he thinks Taylor's political motivations for his argument for secularism are honorable, his theoretical motivations are not. And I don't quite understand how that could be the case. I don't quite understand how one could reconcile bad politics and good theory, or good <laughs> politics and bad theory at the level of thought. I, I mean, I'm, I'm fully aware that people can have bad ideas and do good things, but this seemed to me an odd instance of two kinds of theory that I just can't see how one could be good and one could not be good, but I may be missing something there. So, um, a couple of closing observations, and then we can get to the good part where we talk about this together. Um, first, I'm really struck by the fact that there are some things that are left out of this conversation between Bill Browning and Taylor. Um, and specifically, for our purposes, what's really striking is the degree to which this is a philosophical conversation that proceeds without any reference whatsoever to a very wide range of social scientific discussions. Um, that go beyond, for instance, the kind of classic invocation of Talal Assad, which seems to be de rigueur these days. I'm an Assad fan, but I mean, I mean, you know, you have to cite Assad. Okay, fine. Um, I don't know what you're doing when you do that, but that's okay. Um, I'm thinking especially, though, and I think it would be really interesting to put this into conversation, of Rodney Stark's essay, I don't know if you've seen it, Secularism, colon, Requiescat in Pacha. Um, but there are many like uh, people who really are not thinking about this as a philosophical problem at all, but are thinking about it more as a kind of pedagogical or heuristic issue, and they're not here. Um, that part is taken for granted, that this is the question and these are the general terms on which it has to proceed as a given. Um, that confidence, uh, which is shared by two very smart people, just to be clear, about the purview of their claims, I think should give us all pause. I think we should think about this. And I think what it, what it keynotes that I would say is we always have to be aware, and indeed we probably ought to be wary of the assumptions that the disciplines we bring to bear provide us the full purview on a subject. Um, re religion really does cross all disciplinary lines and Stark's argument that secularism has no purchase at all names an unexamined assumption that these philosophers proceed on and I just think that's interesting to know. It doesn't make the essay, any, the, the debate any less useful but it is striking and worth noting. Um, a second point that I think is related to the first but is different. Um, taken together these two accounts raise a set of questions about the utility of binaries for the study of religion. Um, now, I want to be clear, this is a, we can't live with them and we can't live without them point, okay? Um, I've been enjoying reading over the summer some of our new colleague Richard Miller's work on ethics, and he's got an essay coming out on uh, ethics and the study of religion in which he talks about this. Um, I think that in the history of this institution, the creation of dialogical fields like ethics in society, religion and literature, religion and psychological studies, have all in different ways been attempts to deal with this riddle of what to do about binaries, right? That on the one hand, there are walls of separation in the study of religion that ought always to be interrogated by us. We should always think carefully about that. Um, the ver but we should always, in, in being careful about that, honor what those constituent elements of the wall delineate. And so what I would propose is something like the following, which I, I would offer as a maxim, and I think those of you who were in orientation had this inflicted on you there. Um, there can't be any theology these days without history of religions, and there can't be any history of religions without theology. That we're at a point in time where uh, some of these field approaches have become so thoroughgoingly delineated that kinds of conversations are, uh, in my judgment at least, circumscribed unduly. Um, and just to be clear about that, because someone asked me about this, I'm not, I'm not absolving those who do historical studies from these issues. Uh, there, you know, you, you can play this game in a number of ways, but I think if you want to talk about historically read discourses, the theology, history of religions thing is a good example. Richard Miller's version of this is interesting in his essay. Um, the way he would put it is, ethics has failed to attend sufficiently to debates about theory and method and must do so. Conversely, theory and method has failed to attend to ethics and must do so. Okay. 
So, so I think that kind of position vis-a-vis -vis the delineation of fields and the walls they naturally set up is something we ought to think hard about. Again, handmade to the first point, but I think a little bit different. Um, last of all, and I want to return to my puzzlement here, Bill Gromney is interesting because of his, what I think is really his completely honorable engagement with Taylor and with the classic questions about religion and politics and his entirely salutary uh, dislocation of that discussion from the usual paradigms of the Western democratic and Christian does result nonetheless in this claim for equidistance and this idea that governmental secularism is important as a kind of superior entity vis-a-vis -vis the religions. Now the promise of this argument can be captured on my, and, and also the dilemma can be captured on my reading at least by a comment that I treasure, and I once heard at a lecture here by our colleague Bruce Lincoln, who was in the audience with me. Um, it was a lecture on Chinese bamboo, and the lecture worked with the trope of the circle and how bamboo was used in, in various realms of Chinese tradition to shape circles in different ways to index notions of the sacred and ethics and the like. Um, and at the end of the lecture, Professor Lincoln remarked that um, he wanted to know which kind of circle the speaker was invoking. <laughs> was he invoking the circle that is the most democratic of principles, which is to say a circle is constituted by a set of points that are all equidistant from center? Was he in, in, invoking the notion of a circle which is the most autocratic and that it always has an inalienable center to which everything else defers? It seems to me that that captures very nicely the ambiguity of what Bill leaves us with. Um, and what all of it finally gestures to, I hope, is a sense that there is a tremendously broad and deep and vital set of questions that await us these days in the study of religion. Um, they're questions not just for scholars. They're questions for anyone who cares about religion, whether you're interested in leadership or not. And they're not just for analysts. They're also for practitioners. But they are, after all, those are, these last are also binaries that merit, I dare say, deconstruction as well. So anyway, welcome to Wednesday lunch. And that's what I have to say. And we have 10 minutes. Is that right? No. Yes. 10 minutes for questions. Yes, Mr. Jones. Uh, this is kind of. Uh, I've been waiting for weeks to say. There's Mr. Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jones. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this, is, this is piggybacking off of uh, Saba Mahmoud's argument with politics and piety. Uh, um, and I'm assuming because of Charles Taylor, this, this never comes up um, because of some of these kind of theoretical assumptions. But is there any discussion in the response about the fact that? Secularism and kind of by implication, juridical systems are incapable of even addressing religious feelings without, as she kind of says, like affective violence, where yeah. just people people get their feelings hurt is basically yeah. the, the less fancy way. Of it. No, that's a good question. Um, the answer is yes in both cases, but for different reasons. Um, Taylor is really interested in that problem because Taylor is more skeptical, at least as far as I can tell, than Bill Brown is about the capacity of the state to, the state to maintain the resistance. So it comes up for Taylor as a way of indexing the limits of political institutions to do this. I don't think Taylor goes quite as far as Mahmoud did, does, um, but but he's he's concerned about that. In Bill Gromney, it comes up more because it's part of the process of the religions accommodating themselves to secularism. And it's, and it's recognized humanely, by the way. Um, I want to be really clear, Bill Gromney is no totalitarian, but he really does think that this equal distance that is the solution will require a kind of accommodation. And so what he wants to recognize is that there are these, these limits to approbation and identification. So yeah, it's there. I don't think Mahmoud would be totally happy with either, and it would be really fascinating to hear what she would think about this, because I actually think a problem in Mahmoud's work in this regard is that she elements, she has elements of Bill Brown and elements of Taylor here, and I don't think they're reconciled ultimately. I think she's got a pick. And I, I'm looking forward to seeing her write something about this, because I want to see where she goes with it. It's very, it's a nice question, yes. Yes, please. Yeah, you. Yeah, 
Hey. I had a question. So, uh, Mr. Rami, does he only treat founding Democratic government of India? In that essay, but there are other essays that talk about Gandhi and, and other things, and Rushdie and other things like that. Okay, because I'm wondering, yeah. I think, I haven't read Charles Taylor, but I'm wondering if he's able to treat modern circumstances a little bit better than Mr. Rami, because one of the things that we're seeing in India now, particularly with a lot of members of the BJP is yeah. this internal rationalizing, but also within government. Right. And so is he, since Bill Brown, since he's doing those things, <coughs> religion's approach, would he be able to treat this type of situation? Or would he be able to? I think he would, but let me say why I think that, and you tell me if that answers what you're asking, okay? I think all Bill Brown would say is that's an example of a failed secularism on the part of the state. That what Bill Bromley would say is the state has an obligation to maintain equal distance between all religions, and they're not doing that. So the problem that the, there is there's plenty of room for critiquing. It's not like he thinks the states do this. It's more that he's articulating what he thinks they should do. It's something like that. Right, the theoretical. So in that instance, it's like not banishing Muslims, for example, right. or there's tons of other religions. So in a theoretical sense, would it be nice if we all had like the equal representation? of religious traditions within a secular government, or does he not see that as so solving the problem? That's an excellent question, and I don't have a real clear answer to it, and honestly, it Bill Brown might, and I don't get it, to tell you the truth, or I just haven't read enough. I mean, I've read this one book. He's got other books. Um, I think what Bill Brown would say, based on what I read, is something like the following. <laughs> Really robust political secularism, governmental secularism, is not going to be concerned with equal representation of the religions. In fact, that's precisely what it's not interested in, because religions operate on the basis of internal reasoning. I mean, the analogy, as far as I can tell, of the Christian tradition is the argument between George Lean back in the day Trace about Christianity. Does Christianity's rationale come into is, is, does Christianity owe oh, its rational only to itself, or does it owe its civil society kind of thing? Bill Bromley wants to say, as long as the religions don't try to broach the equidistance, and as long as the state observes the equidistance, we don't have to worry about representation. Because secularism has identified what are genuinely public goods. And to the degree that they are genuinely public goods, the religious traditions must accommodate to them. They can still practice their religions, but that's it. And that's where Taylor's going to go nuts, right? Because what Taylor's going to say is that's totally, I'm, I'm tempted to descend into the press, but totally wrong, incorrect, in the sense that it's simply wrong to assume that religious traditions don't axiomatically care about social goods that are the province of the state, but that nonetheless they reflect. Bill Brownie's reaction is going to be, he's got a form content problem, Jake Taylor. Because in the end, the government's a shell game that's built by the religions, and look what that's got us. So that's the state of that debate. And the reason the reason I think we should be at least somewhat sympathetic to Bill Brahmi is I think the form of content worry is a real one. And I think India is a great example of it with you know the, the, the example you gave among others. So nonetheless, I have certain sympathy with Taylor's res reservation about that for sure. So I don't, does that answer what you're asking? Yeah, kind of. Kind of? I, well, kind of. I, I, I didn't expect you to get up and see just all of Bill Romney's work, but... No, um, no, no, yeah. I didn't mean to do work. No, it's just interesting because they, I feel like he and Taylor, from what you said, seem to be approaching it, right, like the, not the form of content are different, but they seem to be approaching a similar issue in different ways. Absolutely. And I'm not sure if that's just their examples or how they're seeing it. Oh, I see. Oh, I think the examples matter for sure, mm -hmm. but they both think that their theory should apply everywhere. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think the huge weakness of Taylor's book is the increasingly narrow range of reference in it. Uh, that's a real problem. So, yeah. Yes, sir. I'm a little confused, and maybe this is part of the point, about how this notion of equidistance in any way makes an advance on or even really responds to um, the question of secularity or, or separation of church and state, given Taylor's recognition that the project itself has deeply Christian suppositions and hopes. Mm -hmm. If Christianity is, if, if Christian currents of understanding are right there in the center of the circle, what is the meaning of the equidistance? Well, the first meaning of the equidistance is to get those out of there, right? How? So secularism, by making secularism 
involve external reasons that are a religious and commonly held independent of religious affiliation. That's what he wants. And Does he offer examples of what those other than, well, yeah, sure. I mean, Gandhi. This is what he. This is how he reads Gandhi's political philosophy. Is that Gandhi is continually trying to argue for you know the practices of the state as being independent of religious conviction in Thailand. That's his argument. So it's pretty radical in that sense. I mean, I mean, uh, what he he. Yeah, I mean, the beauty of your question is it really is. You know, I'll take your I take your bid and double it to Taylor. You know, Taylor feels like he's made a real contribution to suggest that Christianity contributes deeply to secularism, mm -hmm. right? What Bill Brownie is saying, whether that's true or not, we've got to get secularism out of the business of having any religious dimension at all. So I think that's the answer he would give. Now, I'm fully aware that that's not satisfactory to certain kinds of arguments, but I think that's what Bill Brownie wants to say, in effect. And Bill Brownie's a friend of religion, by the way, to be clear. He just thinks that there are separate, there have to be separate spheres for this to work. And equidistance is crucial for him. So he's ready to be extremely, extremely critical of any kind of, of um, over-appropriation of one tradition vis another, if they're in the if they're in the state. But he also thinks that the that this, the religions will have to accommodate to some degree to make the equidistance work. So the answer is you just take it out. You put it, you put it in, in the outside of the circle, and then the question is, well, is that autocracy or is that enlightened democracy? Right? <laughs> and Bill Brownie would say, hopefully, it's enlightened democracy, and Taylor and probably Mr. Hollander would say, it sounds like autocracy to me. <laughs> so stay tuned. <laughs> anyway, that's the best I can do. Other things? Nobody found the mistake yet. Oh yes, yes. Go ahead. My question has less to do with the content of your conversation, uh -huh. but rather, <clears throat> excuse me, whether or not this conversation can move forward beyond being just a conversation into actually affecting change. Uh -huh. You mentioned um, that the history of religion and theory and theology have been siloed, and you briefly commented on the fact that that has further been separated from sociology and anthropology yeah. and social and scientific fields. Mm -hmm. But what about a further uh, remove from the more applied sciences, international affairs, mm -hmm. economics, political science, mm -hmm. and then one step further into policy makers and the offices of leadership mm -hmm. and bureaucracy? How can, what forum could you see and you think these thinkers could see to move the conversation beyond, I mean, this, as least pejorative as possible, but beyond the ivory tower, beyond the walls of academia, mm -hmm. And into our public realm. Um, or, or do you think there's room for that? I know that there's utility in having a conversation for conversation's sake. However, do well, you think it's possible to move forward and move the conversation into the public sphere? Yes. And what the Next question? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I think I, I want to be very fair, particularly with Bill Brown. And it's a great question. Um, Bill Brown goes on at some length about the 1948 debates. And those are, in fact, policy debates that materially affected the Constitution of the state of India and its subsequent behavior. So, so at that level, I think you know you have an example. And one of the great virtues of Bill Romney, whatever you think of him, is that he does get into the levels you're asking about. Or he wades right into it. And I think a weakness of Taylor is the degree to which he assumes you know it's ironic that his politics kind of run Reagan and intellectual trickle down. Effect. And I think you're right to be nervous about that. So, uh, so that's the first thing I want to say vis-a-vis -vis these two. Um, this is the part of the lecture I didn't give you. I'm, I, I think there is work to be done at the scholarly level to show the different ways in which cultural and political practices work with these debates to advocate certain views. And I'll give you a quick example. Um, Flannery O'Connor is a literal political football in Catholic cultural wars. Okay, um, she her letters are made to um, endorse critiques of Vatican II, um, everything down to non-ordination of women to the priesthood, which are not things she thought. I've spent years reading Flannery O'Connor. You know, it's like saying the Bible has a position on abortion, right, or something. I mean, it's not there, but people use it. On the other hand, 
Last year, a guy named William Sessions published what he called her prayer journal. And, you know, it got a lot of play. It's now talked about as her prayer journal. And if that's a prayer journal, I can run a four-minute mile. <laughs> so, so I do think there's work to, valuable work to be done analytically to say, let's look at how our, our public conversations at micro levels, and I think you could do this with synodical debates in churches, you can do it with state debates over health care and whatnot, where they appropriate religion or ideas about the relationship between the secular and the religious to promote particular positions as if they are either our heritage or the right thing to do right now. So those kinds of things, I think, are there. But I think we always have to press that. And I would freely reckon with the fact that at a certain level, this is a very theoretical discussion. There's no question. My, my other brief is that if you really get stark in the conversation of people like that, that pushes you away from the more abstract side of this. And that's one of the reasons I brought that up. But it's a great question, and I, I, don't, I don't suppose that's a fully satisfactory thing. But I do think that's the case. I think you could pick almost any social issue, and we could look at players in that discussion at the policy level who are doing this kind of thing. You know, the Pope is in Congress last week. Fascinating thing. He invokes in his speech, um, I'm sorry, I told you guys this earlier. I love this stuff. He invokes the terms and principle of the anti-abortion stuff, the quality of life. And then he says he's going to adopt the principle that has persuaded him throughout his ministry, and it's the death penalty. And if you watch, in the Congress, when he invokes the principle, it's the only time every Republican stands up. And as soon as he says death penalty, all the Republicans stand up. <laughs> now, that's another example of how this, this plays out you know, in, in the Congress, right? Um, it's very interesting. And if you go on the blogosphere, you should see what they're all saying about that. Um, it's really interesting. The evangelicals are all talking about how it's really weird that the Pope went to Congress and he didn't mention Christ and he didn't quote John 3.16. What was he thinking? Did they give him wrong speech? Et cetera, et cetera. And the liberals are all jumping down. Look what he did! Look what he did! You know, it's great. So, so I actually think there's a way in which this is pretty intimately connected, but we don't do a good job of talking about it. And we don't do a good job of thinking about what it should do in the policy and things like that. So long answer, I'm sorry. Other things? Oh my gosh. I am gonna stay here and I would have this out of here by one ten. It's one fifteen. I'm sorry. We're adjourned. I can hang around. Thank you for listening. What? What's the mistake? Don't leave us thinking something wrong. If 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 you think I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> Thanks a lot.